Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back in Tempe, which I do not recognize whatsoever. <laughs> All this class is just welcoming that Anthropocene. <clears throat> so you guys are doing it good. Um, I'm just going to read a story for you. Uh, it's called A New Place to Hide. Oh, and thank you, Ames, for that dope introduction. Um, yeah. Uh, it begins with an epigram, epigraph from Epictetus. There is only one way to happiness, and that is to cease worrying about things which are beyond the power of our will. OK, just doing a little math, OK. <clears throat> when I began driving illegally as a sort of amateur chauffeur, I was 13. And this dangerous time in my life robbed me of my innocence. No, I was gutted, my innocence excised. My viscera were scattered across shimmering black pavement, which was my only reliable guide through life. I was a solitary but not lonely child, a condition I hadn't arrived at on my own. Colonial violence, borderland divide and conquer sentimentalisms, assimilative educational hierarchies of race and class, exile and abandonment, all of it natured in me. Put, plain, put plainly, I'd spent my infancy and adolescence on Zanetta, the homelands of the people, my people, I suppose. Eventually, my e idealistic and easily bored parents moved us to Flagstaff, an idyllic mountain town filled with the throat-clenching nostalgia of cowboys and pioneering violence. Most people being cowards, that violence was rarely enacted individually, but in a herd, dull mouth bleeding can easily turn into a battle chant, the stomping of small hooves, a weapon of mass destruction. The town felt like the edge of the world and was, in fact, the western reach of a holy land facing a glacially paced apocalypse. Uprooted midway through the fourth grade, I was thrust into a classroom of mostly white students, we non-whites being a black boy, two Mexican girls, a half Mexican, half Japanese boy, and me. We were suspicious of one another, ignorant of the factors beyond our control that had brought us to such a setting and all too willing to accept the tokenships of our respective white sume cliques. The black boy always chosen first for any sort of sport, but basketball in particular was called Muggsy Bogues, as if anyone remembered the shortest player in NBA history. The two Mexican girls, both first named V, were dubbed disease whores by the cavalier white boys who cornered them into kissing and exploratory touching. And no one knew what to make of the Mexican Japanese boy, whom everyone called Taco Sushi. So he was ignored, which turned him into a pariah and a bully who focused his attacks on each one of us more than once. I don't imagine he made it very far in life or has entered law enforcement, maybe taken a menial position in politics. As for me, I was the wild Indian, the red-skinned savage, the other, the enemy, the target for rocks and gang-ups where I was tied to a tree and burned with imaginary fire amid cupped hand whooping, hand shaped into guns, barrel fingers pointed silently at the sky. This was the town, a simulacrum of childish imagination and a lie good enough to be mistaken for destiny. At the helm of this fourth grade massacre was Miss Reinhold, an older woman with skin like porcelain who I suspected was a runaway nun. Her long pleated plaid skirts and dark billowy blouses cinched at the neck reminded me of the teachers back on the res, who were all nuns. She stalked across the front of the classroom between our rows of desks with her chin held high, ours eyes darting from student to student. Her gray hair tied tightly into a bun had the sheen of gunmetal. She maintained a droll authority, but she maintained a droll tone of authority sharpened with quick sits or quiets, though not one of us was ever made to feel inferior or punished. Instead, we were assigned books to read, along with short written responses for infractions committed against the school policies as interpreted by Ms. Reinhold. Such infractions might include whispering, which burned God's ears, or dawdling, which gave Satan the opportunity for influence. So we must move, sit, or stand with purpose, with intention. For the infraction of melancholy, which amounted to a disregard for imagination, having rebelled against participating in small group activities for a week, I was assigned Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. The book was hardbound in a flated slate cloth cover, the gold lettering pressed into the spine still iridescent. I wrote about the car's large touring engine and horsepower, how its four-seat touring design made it comfortable, comfortable, enough for, uh, comfortable enough to potentially sleep in, and how its ability to transform into a hovercraft or airplane made it the ideal getaway car, which afforded me the imagination to envision a world beyond the one I lived in. 
places in the book like England or France, place names without any shape or detail in my young, naive perception. She collected my work and read it standing there next to my desk, ignoring for once the whispering of the white boys at the front of the class whose commentary increased in volume and pace until Miss Reinhold removed a red pen from her skirt pocket and with a couple flicks of her wrists added three check marks and three plus signs. Dream as big as you can, she said, far beyond this place and allow books to guide your imagination. At the end of that miserable year, which was, be, which was to be followed by many more, the growing urge had been planted in me to get off that mountain and never return, to exile myself further in hope that it might bring about the possibility of happiness or something close to it. Sometime before my 13th birthday, my parents separated without any legal formality, just announced their split in the Alpine Blue Peugeot Coupe that was in constant threat of being repossessed. We were on our way home from a restaurant where we were eating quietly, silent islands in a fog-colored archipelago. My mother sat in the passenger seat, staring out at the window as a missile or comet were coming down at us from the endless sky. I'm done with all this, she said, palm pressed against the glass. Young and beautiful, her well-kept perm, a black crown on her head, she was a quintessence of the Nakaidene clan, hot-tempered, passionate, and whimsical. The glossiness of her chocolate brown eyes inspired trust and a bit of curiosity in any person she met. It was her attention and affection I often sought and was denied, not because she didn't love me, but because she knew our lives together would come to an end. She would move south and eventually disappear altogether. Janelle Minigoach, just another name I'd say, an innocuous, meaningless name. It's been like, a, it's been like that for a while now, replied my father. It's a long time coming, if you ask me. He gazed at the road ahead, perhaps seeing endless possibilities, being a reluctant and ineffectual parent, a philanderer who would take up with another woman, a singer of country songs in the bars and nightclubs of Albuquerque. He dressed like a clothing catalog cowboy, ready to ride into the sunset on the back of almost any creature he came across. Clifton Francisco, bastard son of a Spaniard priest, his mother of the Tetanus Sunny clan, which means tangled clan, I'm told. Entangled he was, a spineless tumbleweed adrift in the wind. Once we were home, my mother told me to pack my things, which wasn't much. A mattress, a gym bag for my clothes and shoes, some toys I rarely played with, and my small stack of books from the school library. When we left the reservations, all our belongings had fit into the old GMC pickup we owned then, and packing up on that day had felt similar to how it felt today. We'd always been transient, ready to flee or move at a moment's notice, and I've always kicked myself for not somehow noticing my lack of care and stability. This isn't happening because we don't love you anymore or anything, Mom said, helping me pack. We must correct what's not been right. Okay, I said. I went to live with my cousin, who in her early 20s was pursuing a master's degree in mathematics and teaching as a graduate assistant at the State University in Flagstaff. Her responsible nature was due in part to our strict and thrifty grandmother who had raised her while her parents vanished into their depression and the poison of its alleviation. That was her in a sense. Her fondness for me was not at all veiled. She had just purchased a newly built condo in a blighted neighborhood that was within walking distance of my junior high, and her ads for a roommate had come to nothing, so I filled the vacancy. Based on her experience with her own parents, she made an arrangement with my father and mother that entailed a monthly allowance of $150 from each of them with the stipulation that if they missed or denied me these monthly payments, I would go to the authorities, maybe the school counselor, with a story of neglect and abandonment, which wouldn't be so far-fetched, so beyond the stereotypical situation of young minority parents ill-suited for heavy responsibility. In this way, I was beginning to understand how to pit expectation against the potential for profit, and in this way, I was truly assimilated. Father puffed out his chest, a bottom rung rooster. We will re renegotiate these payments, he said, when you turn 16, see if you're in need of money then too. Mother, with her impeccable posture, sat in a chair pursing her red stained lips. And, she said, when you're 18, hopefully grown into a man by then, the payments will stop. For a year, their payments arrived on time and every other month until they didn't arrive at all. My parents eaten up by their lives and the ravenous world. The stopped payment should have rattled me more or forced me to follow through on the threat of going to the police or child protective services, but I didn't assume my parents had vanished with even a semblance of happiness. 
I knew they had desiccated in their own despair. With my share of the rent, utilities, and food costs suddenly my own, I was encouraged to find employment. You're on your own now, said my cousin. You have me, but you must learn to make the larger decisions about how you want your life to be, and the more options you have, the better. That way, you'll always have a new place to hide. At my age, employment options were limited, so I mowed the lawns of a few of the more affluent houses closer to the base of Mount Eldon using a push mower that required weekly retightening and re-oiling, rake the leaves and pine needles on those lawns, walk the dogs that shit in the leaves and pine needles, as well as the neighbor dogs of the shitting dogs. It was during this time that Ms. Reinhold would once again pass through my life, although briefly. I discovered that she was the widow of a Mr. Brinkerhoff, and after he passed early in their marriage, she had made a decision to go by her maiden name to hide the small inheritance he left her. A modest house and a savings account with enough for a comfortable retirement, though most of it went to her daily caretakers, as she was in the final throes of dementia. Once a week for two hours, I dusted the antique furniture and picture frames filled with the memories of their travels and life together, faded black and whites of them embracing on a beach or standing atop a mountain. I vacuumed the immaculate jade carpet and kept the house just as it had been on the day Mr. Brinkerhop died. All of this after-school work managed to keep the trauma of my abandonment at bay, but only for so long. After a month, Miss Reinhold passed in her sleep alone. Her departure unmoored me and I became a torrent of crying fits, overcast with insomnia. It occurred to me that Miss Reinhold had lived in a mausoleum made in memory of her husband, and she sat each day prepared to join him in her final absence from this world. My memories didn't fill a shoebox, and the future felt like a bottomless well. I began to skip school, sleeping late into the afternoon, which forced my cousin to drag me from bed and into the shower one evening, and then plop me down in the living room, where a pizza sat steaming on the coffee table. I ate ravenously while she chewed slowly, deep in thought. She told me it was time I snapped out of it. I couldn't go on like this any longer because my clients would lose their patience and school would begin to pry. It's all right to be out sick a week, she said, in order to get yourself back together, but any longer than that and what you had before might not be there. She asked what might make me feel better again. I thought quietly, munching a slice, and answered that trips to the library had once been something I had looked forward to but had forgotten about since the departure of my parents. There had been, in those days, a single public library across town from where I lived with my parents and from where I, from where I now lived with my cousin. It was too far for me to walk, especially around trip. When Dad still existed, he took me, I explained to my cousin. It was an activity that brought him happiness, at least as far as I could discern. He reveled in being away from Mom, acted childish and giddy, and would tell me off-color jokes. What do Hopis have as long and hard, he would ask. I would shrug, eager for him to reveal the answer, the last names he would say, laughing as we sped towards the library. Once we were there, my father let out let me out at the front entrance, said he'd be back in two hours. Plenty of time for me to wander around and wonder at the stacks. He never returned on time. It was always half an hour to an hour late, dizzy in his boots and flush face, shirt half tucked, hair must, smelling like soured perfume and chlorine. My cousin nodded firmly, told me to finish eating and grab my shoes. She had an idea and wanted to know if I still remembered how to drive. On the res, it's understood that once your little legs can reach the clutch, brake, and gas pedals, and once you're able to gaze over the hood and dashboard, you learn to drive. Though this isn't something specific to reservations, but to most bucolic pastoral communities where the police exist on the fringes of one's imagination, where the police are indeed the numbskulls who never left town and drake themselves into such servitude, their civil service like a lifetime of failed monthly AA chips. It being understood that the youth will fulfill the expectation of being drivers, uncles and aunties, Nelly and Che, will ask for livestock and hay to be hauled, for cousins and child neighbors who are left behind to be packed into vehicles and taken far enough away for the adults to kick back a little and reminisce. My driver's education began when I was eight or nine on the dirt and rutted roads around coal mine Mesa after the funeral of my only living grandparent. Paternal or maternal, I don't remember. I learned when to accelerate and decelerate, how to ease the wheel against a fishtail and drive in reverse using the mirrors, the basics, I assumed. 
So when my cousin and I took to the evening streets in her champagne-colored Honda Civic and continued through more nights to solidify my apprenticeship to the wheel, it was as if the black asphalt had become my veins. Every glowing street light as synapse bursts and the deeper darkness of the alleyways and trees of the forest, my soul. One weekend night, my cousin didn't return home from a night out with friends. I assumed she'd lost track of time and slept over, which quelled my initial worry, thinking of my cousin curled up on a couch with a blanket and a shared bowl of popcorn, the glow of an action comedy flickering across her smiling face. In fact, she'd been passenger in a car full of intoxicated friends, the driver included. A cop watched the vehicle drift and swerve and turned on his red and blue lights, pulling the car over. The friend who was driving failed the sobriety test, and because no one else was sober either, they all spent the night in jail. My cousin walked across town the next morning, entered the front door sweating, her eyes sleepless and swollen. The drunk tank isn't a place you want to spend the night, she said. A bunch of Johns and shit kickers getting in each other's faces. She explained the possibility of losing her scholarship if the DUI had fallen on her. I've worked too damn hard for this shit to get fucked up, she yelled. This was, of course, before the days of smartphone apps and a choice of cab company, the only game in town being Settler Cab, which generally refused to pick up Navajos or any other minority, especially if they were drunk and looking to get home. If they did happen to be allowed into the cab, these unfortunate folks would be dropped off on the outskirts of town where they either got lost or picked up by the police and in some instances froze to death. Women were often assaulted or raped, then abandoned to be gathered by the authorities, and their degradation continued further. Small mountain towns have dark, dark, dark underbellies, no matter how quaint, friendly, or liberal they seem. That's an illusion built upon the death and destruction of an indigenous population, hijacked and rewritten narratives that showcase the leather mask of progress, but from whose skin is the mask cut? The girls, had been in the, the girls who had been in the car with my cousin were two sisters, also Navajo and related to me by clan, which compelled, me, which compelled them to refer to me as their daddy Yeja, or their little or small daddy. And the girl who had been driving, a half Hopi, half Navajo girl from my cousin's hometown of Tuba City, who was like a dart or hummingbird, was, and was affectionately called Birdie. She and my cousin had played on the varsity basketball team together. Birdie, a point guard, my cousin a small forward because of her solid frame and ability to box out bigger forwards and centers using her strength and elbows. The sisters, a year apart, had dominated their high school's volleyball squad, bringing home three back-to-back -back state championships. This crew of native girls was confident, fist-throwing, tough, sharp-witted, with vulgar senses of humor bordering on blasphemy, which made them the ideal role models and customers. There wasn't a narc among them. Um, so he does his first chauffeuring gig, it goes well. And then everyone disappears and he meets a new friend. The night was a void when Dee tapped lightly on the window with the bulbous knuckle of his pointer finger. I cracked the window enough to prevent him from inserting it past the joint. Hey, my man, he said. The girl said he could give me a ride. He told me they had found some snags that his friends had ditched him and shrugged as if he could relate. I was trepidatious, but he named the girls, knew where each had gone to high school and what position each played, though he looked too old to have been in the same graduating class. My place is a couple miles south near the interstate, he said. I'll pay you 20 bucks. Dee handed me a crisp note and sat in the passenger seat as I drove. At some point, he had me veer right onto a road that went past a new subdivision of prefabricated homes, where the city limits met forest service land and the street lights vanished. We turned onto a nondescript road and arrived at a log cabin. The hardwood, the hard bark logs stacked like bones. The trim of the windows and door rays painted sludge green. Dim light emanated from a window onto a white pickup parked askew. Dee grabbed my shoulder, sending shutters down my body. All right, my man, he said, listen. If I'm not back in 20 minutes, you leave and don't worry about me, okay? I nodded and he checked his watch against the digital numbers glowing blue on the dashboard and synced it to his timepiece. 20 minutes, he said, pointing to me and then the treed and darkened road we had arrived on and exited the car. An inescapable loneliness overtook me and I began to weep. 
After 10 minutes, I was able to calm myself and wipe away my boyish tears. The dread tightening in my throat loosened and my death bell pained in my ears. At the 19 minute mark, I was depressing the brake pedal and shifting into drive when Dee suddenly opened the passenger drawer and got in, having emerged out of the darkness like a ghost or time traveler. He smelled sour, hot, and chemically musky. Go, he said. I turned on the headlights and sped through the forest dark. Dee rolled down the window, closed his eyes, and leaned his head back so the night, so the cold night air blew through his black hair. I asked him where we were going, and he laughed. Straight to hell if you're not careful, he said. I'll tell you, just drive. The window crested over him, the starlight contoured the shadows of his dark brown face, his slab of body rested. I've dropped him off at a large apartment complex at the edge of town that seemed to have sprung up overnight. Tall buildings like Lego sets were clustered around lit pathways and manicured grassy amoebas. Dee punched my arm, and when he got out of the car, told me to tell my cousin to get me a pager and to give him the number right away. Here's an extra 20, he said, to help you get that pager. Uh, I'm just going to skip to the last scene. So basically, the kid becomes a uh, you know, drug mule for a drug dealer pimp. <laughs> that's, what, that's what happens when you're young, right? Um, and he's suddenly left alone by himself without any of his friends. The younger of the sisters paged me after she broke up with the soil studying Apache. She was bloated and unhappy, dating an older, sloppy older white man, a moneyed alcoholic who dodged alimony payments and got blackout drunk. I didn't understand what she saw in this trucker hat wearing bristly chin douchebag. Beyond the possibility that it was his deep pockets, I assumed it was loneliness or regret that had burst self-loathing, self-punishment. The two had gotten into an altercation at one of the meat market bars frequented by college athletes and Greek lifers who believed they were God's gift to the earth, where they'd been drinking beer and eating cheap tacos since the early afternoon when an older, desperate crowd sought an expired sensation of their use for no cover charge. At one point, well into the evening, the man had thrown a half to eaten taco at the younger sister, poured his beer on her head, and pushed her face with his palm. She, of course, retaliated by throwing insults and slaps until she escaped to a payphone near the bathroom, paged me, and awaited my call. When she returned to the table, the man had been apprehended by the bouncers and forced to wait outside. She was told she needed to leave as well, but pleaded with the bar staff to let her wait inside until her ride arrived. Pulling him up outside the bar, I saw the man leaning against the square brick pillar, hardly able to stay on his feet. The younger sister came rushing out of the bar and climbed into the passenger seat. As she did, the man pulled open the rear door and launched himself onto the seat, passing out immediately. One of the bouncers shoved the man's feet and legs into the vehicle with his foot and slammed the door. I drove without direction, concerned the man might wake at any moment. But the younger sister assured me that once the man was passed out, it was always for the night. She told me to head past the shit kicker communities and go down into the desert lowlands north of the mountain. After an hour, she told me to pull over at a small, ancient looking convenience store that was the last place you could purchase booze before entering the western end of the reservation. I parked by the near end of the building. She got out and opened the rear door, and using all her might, which was significant, pulled the man out of the back seat by his feet. His head clipped some part of the car, and I heard him make a grunt yelp noise, which was followed by the dull sound of a body striking the ground and a commotion of dirt. When she got back in the passenger seat, I sped back to town. At some point, she removed the man's wallet from her pocket, took out the cash, and handed it to me. Then she threw the wallet out the window. Roll that fucking fucker, she said, tears at the edges of her eyelids. She guided me to her place where she showered while I checked my pager and waited on the couch flipping mindlessly through TV channels. I thought about calling my cousin or, D or Dee to see if anything was happening that night so as, an, as to have an excuse to leave. Dumping a drunk white guy on the reservation border without any money or ID must to amount to some type of crime, though I told myself it would be fine. When she emerged from the shower, towels wrapped around her head and torso, the latter, the latter hardly covering her upper thighs, she looked calmer but still filled with a sadness beyond my understanding. She took my hand, led me to the bathroom, and embraced me, whispering thank you over and over until her towel fell to the floor and she was naked, her skin hot from the shower. She undressed me, me removed the towel, absorbing the water from her hair, and we lay on her bed together. She taught me the way to kiss her, where to rub and insert my fingers and how to do it. 
When we were finished, she fell deeply asleep, and I trembled and wept until, quietly until dawn, imagining an apparition standing in the doorway there to punish me for what my body had done. When sunlight overtook the room, I was alone. The sound of the living room and kitchen being destroyed by two screaming banshees paralyzed me with fear. I wanted to call Dee or my cousin, but there was no phone in the bedroom. I heard a gunshot, another three in quick, angry succession. My head rang sharply, and then, like an enormous bell cast into the ocean and sinking, I heard nothing at all. Thanks.